Welcome back to another episode of the Ultimate Relationship Show. I'm your host, Midori Verity, and today we are going to be talking about cognitive and behavioral therapies for couples and for individuals. We're going to be talking about comedians, all kinds of stuff related to psychology because we have a woman here who has such a plethora and wide experience in those industries and in those areas that we're going to go all over the place. And it's going to be a very interesting and exciting talk because today I have Dr. Ildiko Tabori and she is in LA. She works in the mental health field. She's been in the mental health field for more than 15 years. She works with comedians. She has been hired by the Laugh Factory. Those of you who are from LA know how big the Laugh Factory is and, and the type of comedians that they get. Um, she's also worked in forensic and criminal psychology. She has worked in the LA, LA jail or prison. I'm not sure which one is a jail. LA County jails. Yeah. LA County jail. Um, and worth with athletes and has just a wide range of information. So let's get started because we have a lot to talk about. So welcome. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. So tell us briefly about your, about your background, go a little bit further into, into what you do exactly. Okay. Well, I am a licensed clinical psychologist here in Los Angeles. I also have a specialty in neuropsychology so um, and also geriatrics. Um, and so I do kind of a little bit of a lot of things. Um, I work with, um, you know, your traditional type of therapy um, with individuals. I work with couples and families. And um, I also do a lot of psychological testing and neuropsychological testing. Neuropsychological uh, testing meaning looking at anything dealing with uh, the brain and behavior relationships. Um, from traumatic injuries to non-traumatic injuries like strokes and aneurysms and things like that. Okay, so I really wanna know more about the comedians that you work with and why, why do they hire you? Why are you hired by the Laugh Factory to go in there and, and help these people? What, what is it? What's, what's going on there? Well, this program actually, it's been going on for more than five years now, and um, it was the brainchild of the owner of the Laugh Factory, Jamie Masada, and he, I mean, he's had the Laugh Factory, I think, since 1979, and he knows a lot of comedians, and as you know, we've, we lose a comedian probably at least once a year to some sort of maybe suicide or overdose, whether accidental or purposeful, and um, he was uh, getting very concerned about the comedians who were passing away and thinking that they needed some extra help more so than he could provide them. And he's, you know, kind of like the dad of this whole comedian bunch. And, um, he brought me in and, uh, see the comedians over there at the club and I've an office there and it's a program that's been going um, very strong and I absolutely love working with the comedians and they are amazing people and incredibly smart. Um, I have a theory that uh, if I gave them all IQ tests that they would come out as higher than the average um, in our uh, higher than the average in the normal population. And I would agree. The fact that they can come up with jokes as quickly and I mean, it's, it's amazing. So I would right. probably agree with you. Right. So what is it? What is it that makes a comedian? What, what kind of trends do you see with them that makes them so, you know, obviously they're talented, but what causes them to behave, to want to become a comedian? What's going on in, the, in their head that you've seen? Um, that makes them want to be a comedian. Why, why do they use that? I, I'm assuming it's kind of an outlet for them, a way for them to respond. Um, you know, if you're there as a psychologist, I'm assuming there's certain trends that you see, certain types of behavior patterns that lead up, that, that's common in, in some comedians. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, it's just like with any other artist. It's just a form of their artistry um, that they find... Um, uh, 
that's their calling or actually what I've heard a number of times I've been corrected by the comedians themselves where they say that um, comedy, they didn't uh, go to comedy, comedy came to them. So they got called into comedy and it's usually, it's not always necessarily the class clown, um, but it's this, um, this high that they've gotten um, when they get up on stage and they can look at the world the same way you and I look at the world and put a funny bent on it. And it's, you know, what they talk about are, you know, universal themes, love, relationships, kids, families, money, jobs, things like that. Um, and then they look at it and they make us laugh at the things that we're all experiencing, whether it's painful or not. Yeah, that's true. It's funny. They can take something so serious and then you're laughing about it. It's like, what? That's funny. That's not funny. <laughs> but it, it is funny if you take a look at it. And then, you know, laughter is, you know, I mean, they say laughter is the best medicine, but that is actually really true. Because when you're laughing, you can't be sad. I mean, there's just no way, even if it's for a brief moment. Um, you know, one of the things that I recommend with people who are kind of depressed sometimes are, you know, go watch a comedy. Um, I actually prescribe going to see people at the Laugh Factory, going and seeing a show at the Laugh Factory, because, it, you know, even if it's for an hour and a half, two hours, just get out of your head and listen to somebody and make and laugh about it, laugh about your life, laugh about your experience, laugh about somebody else's experiences. And, you know, that's, it, it, it puts you into a different mindset when you can laugh and you do yeah. feel better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a way that you choose to respond to the situation. So if you can laugh at a situation versus freaking out, yes. um, it, you, you're health, healthier and happier. So laughter yeah. is a huge Right. healthy medicine. Right. It is. It is. As long as it's not used as a defense mechanism, which we tend to do sometimes too, but, um, it, it really is. Um, you know, it, especially when we're sad, it's just get out of your head for a little bit. We live up in our head too much. Um, especially here in the U S we do stay in our head and we ruminate about all these negative things. And, um, when you get out of it and start thinking about other things, it, it goes away and it naturally goes away. Yes. So I want to ask you, you work with celebrities, you work with athletes, you work with comedians, but in those industries, as in so many jobs and industries, you can have highs and then you can have big lows, meaning you might be an A-lister one day, but then the next day, for whatever reason, you no longer are getting picked for roles. How do you help your clients deal with that? Because again, it can be in anything. It doesn't, you don't have to be an actor. You don't have to be an athlete. You could be anyone. And that happens to all of us. So what are some of the tips that you, or some of the ways that you help your clients get through that? Right. That is actually a big thing. Because everybody thinks that, you know, if I just make more money, I'm going to be happier. Or everything's going to be much easier. And, you know, money Money does make things a little bit easier because, okay, I guess our bills are going to be, be paid, but then our living expenses do get higher. So you have to maintain that lifestyle. And, um, but it, and money and success and fame and whatever you want to call it is, um, it's a temporary reprieve from the sadness. It doesn't keep you happy. I mean, you can ask every rich person in the world and there, I don't think anybody's going to say, I'm happy all of the time because none of us are. Um, and so, you know, you have the ones who are on their way up and then you have, then you start coming down. And one of the things that um, I work with on that is redefining what success is. And, you know, at different points in our life, we think success is this thing. It's this, this, maybe it's money, maybe it's fame, it's maybe it's making, um, uh, having more notoriety. Um, and then as we get older, you know, our tastes change and our desires change and our lifestyle changes. You know, maybe we've gotten married or in significant relationships, we have kids and we want something a little more quieter. Um, and so we don't have that that desire to go hustle as much as we once used to. And so you have to kind of redefine what that success would be. So success might be, okay, I'm making money, so I have a roof over my head and I have enough money. Like for me, my big thing is I love to travel. So I want to you know, maintain my home and maintain my practice and get on a plane and go wherever I want to go as much as I possibly can. And so that's, 
that is, you know, one of the ways that I, I work with in terms of um, changing your desires in terms of what success can and cannot be. Okay. So if you have someone who comes to you and, you know, I know this is not just athletes, but you know, you have an athlete or someone or anyone who made a lot of money and all of a sudden it's all gone or it's mostly gone and their success, not only physically, but also financially is gone. How do you walk someone through that to help them change their mindset so that they can get back to a happier place and also be successful in something else? Because the, you know, they might not, they, maybe they broke their leg and they're no longer able to, to be an athlete any longer. So what are some tips that you give for that? One of the things that um, I think is really important, which we don't do enough of, um, is uh, preventing that from happening in the first place. So, you know, if you think about an athlete, you only have a certain, certain lifespan um, in, in, in whatever field, like an NFL player or something like that with the Super Bowl coming up, you only have a certain life lifespan in that. And then of course there could be injuries and then you're getting paid a certain amount. You want to make sure that you have good financial advisors to begin with. So you set that money aside. So in case something happens or when the career goes away, what are you going to do? Um, I think education is a big thing. Uh, you know, finish your schooling finish your schooling. I know people um, will, uh, you know, men will get drafted into the NFL and leave college. But I think eventually, you know, unless you've got some skills there in terms of business or um, a, what is it, journalism out there, um, broadcast journalism, um, then you need to figure out what it is that you're going to do with that, starting a, a starting some sort of company or working, working with other kids, coaching, those sorts of things. Um, and so I think that the best way to deal with that is to try to get them ready for it right at the beginning. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when we're working for a corporation, you know, get that, that 401k matching plan, you know, put your money into it, put as much money into it as you can. And right now, yes, your paycheck is going to be lower and you're not thinking about that when you're 25, but when you're 55, you're going to appreciate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It made me think of Steve Young. Do you remember the commercial with Steve yeah. Young where the lady was sitting next to him and she asked him what his career was. And he said he was a football uh, NFL football um, quarterback, and she said, oh, "That's not true." And then he came back. He's like, "I'm an attorney." I just thought that was so funny. Yeah, and he but. actually he he actually has. Um, I just finished reading a book um, all about the NFL, and it he is he runs a, a, a foundation that helps um, kids in sports and things like that, and bringing um, sports to kids. And, and I forgot what the name of the foundation is, but yeah, he's. And I think he's up in your area as well. So I think he is too. Yeah. Yes. I think Silicon Valley is somewhere up there. Yeah. But, um, yeah. He's, he's a good example of how to be successful. Right. And what, what's unfortunate with him though, too, is that he didn't want to get out of football when he, when he did, but with, you know, he was getting too many concussions mm -hmm. and um, he made the decision regretful. Well, I wouldn't say regretfully, but um, it wasn't his choice to make the decision to retire when he did, but he, he admits now that he is glad that he, he did retire when he did um, because things could have been much worse in terms of his cognitive capacity. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think, and, and that brings me to another point with, just, you know, for anyone, sometimes it's time to change. It's time to change our career. Not necessarily because um, your concussions, but it could be because of health. It could be because maybe you were um, doing physical labor and now you're not able to anymore. And just being able to pivot and find something new that will work for you and break through those fears, right? Because usually when you have to change, it's a fear. Right. And so... How do you help people with that? If, if they're scared to change, because you, know, you kind of get comfortable and you have a certain amount of money that you need to make, but it really isn't the best thing for you. Either you hate what you're doing or you physically shouldn't be doing it anymore. I think that we need to actually, if, if, if we look at it from a, a financial perspective, I, I start explaining to people, well, let's put a price on your happiness. So how much is your happiness worth? And if you're miserable in your job, you know, why don't you find out what you 
want to do something that's going to make you happy and maybe it's less money but are you going to be happier with it and 99 percent of the time yes that's going to make them happier because they're they're going to be more excited they're going to want to get up in the morning they're going to want to go to work they're going to want to do whatever it is new that they want to do and so you know i think if we start you know in, in the u.s too so again everything is you know about capitalism and you know how much is something worth so if we put um, a value, that kind of value on who we are, um, then it starts to change the way we think. Not that I'm saying that we should put that value on us, but you shouldn't, um, you know, if that's the way we're thinking, then, you know, let's go with it. Let's go with I it. I like that. I think that's such a good, a good way to frame it is what's the price of your happiness and actually putting a dollar sign to that. I think that's a very strong way to position right. it. Right. And same with your health. You know, everybody, I, I don't know how many people, you know, they come in for an initial evaluation and I'm like, well, when was your last physical? Oh, it's been years. I'm like, go to the doctor. That's what your insurance is for. Well, I have a high deductible. Well, deal with it. Um, would you rather, you know, pay the, you know, $500 for your, you know, deductible or, you know, spend the next two years battling cancer? Right. Right. So, yeah. Sometimes we just need someone to kick us in the butt and say that to us, right? Just kind of shake us. Right. Yeah. I mean, just go to the doctor. That's what insurance is there for. And yeah, whether you have a high deductible or low deductible, whatever, go and take care of it. I would rather, you know, be, you know, take a proactive approach to, you know, your health and your emotional well-being than, you know, have to go back and go, oops, I wish I would have you know, gone to the doctor and, you know, had a blood test or gone to the gynecologist and things like that. So just, yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for every woman, but go. Yeah. You know? Very, very true. Very, very true. Okay. So this is a big subject, depression in a relationship. So one spouse gets really depressed. doesn't matter what the reason why is, but the other spouse is left there trying to deal with it, especially if you have kids, that can be extremely challenging. So how, what are some tips for, especially the spouse who is not suffering from depression? How do you have some ideas on how they can help their partner get through it and helps the family stay intact and stay healthy? Absolutely. I think that the two most important things are to be supportive of the person who's depressed. And hopefully you don't have two ends of the couple Ooh, depressed yeah. at the same time. That would be really difficult. But, um, you know, it, it's, you need to be supportive of your significant other, um, but also don't enable them. Mm. So if they are depressed, you want to support them and, um, you know, working through the depression, but don't enable them like, oh, it's okay. Let me take care of everything. So you can go lie in bed all day. You don't want to do that. You know, it's like, okay, okay, you're a little bit tired. You have your down day. You need a half a day to yourself. Great. I'll take the kids. We'll go out. But then when we get back now, it's family time. And now we have to, you know, have dinner together. We'll play a board game or whatever it is that, you know, families do together. You don't want to enable that. You want to encourage them to get treatment because you cannot be your significant other's therapist. You know, that's why, you know, in my field, we don't treat, you know, significant others. We don't treat family members. We don't treat um, former significant others. Um, it's, you know, that's a big no-no in, in my field. And because it, you're too close to it. Um, you can support them. You can encourage them. You can assist them in um, finding some resources. But you don't do it for them. Got it. Got it. Okay, so don't enable them. But what if they've been suffering for a long time? So it's not just PMS. It's um, something that goes a lot deeper. That's kind of a different story, isn't it? Or I mean, well, it's, it's just kind of the longer end of the same story. Um, you know, why has it been allowed to go on for so long? I mean, we're all going to get depressed. Um, we've all been depressed in our life and we all will be depressed again. It just, it mat it's the varying degrees of depression. And sometimes it's, you know, something that we call like a, a mild depression or a dysphoria or a dysthymia um, or something that's, that's a lot deeper. Um, but, 
you know, something that's a mild depression can go into a major depression if it's not worked through in the initial stages. So if you see somebody going down that path, again, you don't want to enable them to, to go down there, go, okay, go talk to somebody now. Let's deal with that. You know, do what, with, do what you need to do um, in order to take care of yourself, whether it's medication or therapy, both. Um, those sorts of things. The other thing too is, you know, here's where, you know, the medical issues and the um, mental health issues collide is that a lot of times we have um, medical conditions that present as psychological problems. Um, and so that's why it's really important to check in with your primary care physician, you know, at least once a year. Um, you know, things like, um, thyroid conditions. I had a woman come in to me um, a few years back and she was, I don't know, late 20s, early 30s. She was in grad school. She was doing really, really well. None, nothing in her life had changed and everything was, was good. I mean, she had the normal stressors of, of her grad school, but things were going fine. And all of a sudden she was getting panic attacks and these panic attacks were so bad that it was, you know, she couldn't even drive in her car on the freeway um, because it was, you know, she felt so closed in. And um, one of the things that I, I say to people when they initially come in is, you know, go and get a medical check because um, we want to rule these things out. And it turned out that she ended up having thyroid cancer. Um, wow. Yeah, and she did the radiation, and she's fine now. I mean, she's doing great. I haven't seen her in a long time, so she's doing great. Um, but she had the radiation. She takes you know, the, her medication, and she's doing great. And that's what the problem was. So it's not necessarily with your head. And I've been hearing a lot and reading quite a bit about this, that your diet yes. and other things that you don't I even think so about have such an effect on your mental health. So right. I'm, yeah, going to the... Just to your primary care doctor is kind of the first step. Right. Diet, exercise, things like that. There was a recent study that came out um, that just even looking at dehydration and depression. So like if you're dehydrated, you tend to get more depressed. So drink, drink water. Ah, for so many reasons. To get rid of the wrinkles. Yes. And then also <laughs> for depression, so many pluses. Yeah. And that, I mean, that, it, it, to me, I, I never connected those two. Um, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, yeah, that makes absolute sense. Absolute sense, you know, because when you're dehydrated, you're feeling kind of, I mean, think of your body when it is dehydrated. You're feeling kind of icky and, you know. Lethargic yeah. and it affects your brain. Absolutely. Right, right. Huh. Getting enough sleep is important too. And not just sleep. Like you can sleep for 12 hours and have it be restless sleep, although you shouldn't be sleeping for 12 hours. But, um, but have it be a restful sleep. You know, what's better is, you know, six hours of restful sleep than 12 hours of restless sleep. Right. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So, wow, we've covered a lot and this is so <laughs> interesting. Do you have any other tips for couples, kind of things that you see on a regular basis, common issues? Do you have any, anything else that we should cover with, as far as couples go? Yes, with couples, one of the one of the biggest things um, is the lack of communication or the miscommunication um, when people are um, arguing, and you know people don't want to fight. And I think that you know it's fine to fight. It you, we have to fight because you can't get along with everybody, um, especially the, your significant other, the one that you're around most of the time or in communication with most of the time. You're going to argue about things, um, so it's okay to fight, but it's important to fight respectfully, and you don't want to yell, name call, um, never ever ever get physical, um, or and and by physical I'm also meaning restricting people. I had a couple come in yesterday, and you know they had gotten into a fight the week before and he was preventing her from leaving the apartment when she just wanted to go and take a walk. I'm like, let her leave, let her leave, let her take a walk so she can cool off and come back. Um, he didn't touch her, but he stood in front of the door. And that's, you know, that's really physical. So it's okay to fight, but you know, fight 
as calmly as you possibly can and listen to each other. Because when you're yelling at each other, all you hear is yelling. You don't hear what the message is. Right. And, you know, it's important to listen to what your partner is saying. I don't know how many times people come in and they're talking to each other and they're not hearing each other. And I'm sitting there going, wait, 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 that's not what she just said. That's not what I heard. I heard her say this. And then when it gets repeated in how I repeat it, they hear it. I'm like, okay, you need to hear it from her, not from me. But it's, it's a lot of, you know, kind of rewording or reframing and getting them to listen to, to what the other person is really saying. But pick up on like one or two words in there and then grab onto them and miss the entire message. To or they do the, yeah, mind reading. Mind yes. reading is a big issue in relationships. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So we it's. I know that I want flowers today. Well, did you tell him? <laughs> oh, oh. He you should know, just know. How many times have you heard that? He should just know or she should just know, right? Yeah. How are you expected to know if you don't tell them? Right. Yeah. Good reminder. Right. But this has been just fascinating to hear all the different um, levels of psychology and um, the people that you treat. So I so appreciate it. And where can we find more information on you? Uh, my website is drildicotabori.com. So okay. You can find me there. <laughs> Great. And then just as I always say, if you did not have a chance to write that down or you're not quite sure about how to spell it, all you have to do is just go to midoriverity.com and we will have all of her information there and the links to find her. So thank you again for being here with us and sharing all your, your vast amount of knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Thanks.